Here we'll, we'll do an introduction and get everyone acquainted. With. Um, so this is the so-called master class. <laughs> and um, of course what I'm wanting to offer today is uh, I want to tell you a little bit about myself to start and then ask everyone to uh, introduce themselves and so I can find out who we who we are and what we're going to maybe do <laughs> cuz we're not going I'm not going to I'm not going to talk at you for a long time we'll try to get involved in doing things uh, pretty quick so the first time I ever came to Europe uh, was 1962 and I came to, to Holland. I, was, I came here for the uh, Gaudiamus uh, Festival, 1962, 50 years ago, huh? <laughs> so, what were you doing 50 years ago? Still out of So um, I just uh, had a good time recently. I was at Princeton University to, to to do a colloquium, and uh, um, my host was a former student of mine, a composition student. And um, so I, I said to, to him, I'm going to read from Software for People, which is, a, which is a talk that I gave in Mexico City in 1978. So I asked him, what were you doing in 1978? He was just born. <laughs> so... Uh, I, I guess I've been around for a while. <laughs> and um, coming up in May, May 30th, is my 80th birthday. So uh, I've, I've been around to cause trouble for eight decades. <laughs> and uh, so I'm still having a good time making trouble wherever I go. <laughs> so... <clears throat> Uh, so I'm happy to see everybody and uh, uh, really look forward to to our uh, adventure today, what, whatever it may turn out to be. And so um, I'm going to uh, uh, tell you a little bit about deep listening, which is the practice that has evolved out of my work since that 1978 article, uh, Software for People. Um, the software being uh, the sonic meditations that I composed in the 70s. And those son sonic meditations were um, directions uh, or instructions for the direction of attention in, in, uh, in listening and sounding. And so that uh, has elaborated over these uh, years into the practice which is called deep listening and that I uh, practice myself and offer as a, a uh, just as a way of being and a way of uh, approaching uh, making music or living whatever however you want to work with it or not <laughs> it's a uh, take it or leave it practice <laughs> okay so <coughs> Um, I think it would be good if I can find out uh, who each person is and if you wouldn't mind um, telling, us, telling us your name um, and also what, what it is that you do, what you practice as an artist or a musician or as a person, whatever it is. Uh, so if we could do that, then we can... I can begin to think about how we're going to shape the day. So what I'd like is to uh, uh, introduce you to uh, some of the exercises that, that I do, energy exercises, I call them, and then I'd like for us to do a listening meditation and then uh, to do uh, some uh, sonic meditation um, pieces that everybody can do uh, 
And then probably it'd be lunchtime, is that right? We could be having a lunch in the, in, in the midst of this? Yes. Okay. okay. And then after lunch, uh, depending on um, what people do, you know, either if you're musicians or whatever, we're going to play, do some improvisation that will be kind of coming out of what we do, of the exercises that we do this morning. So after lunch, uh, then play. I think the idea is to have it everything before lunch. Uh, we I'm sorry? Lunch. We have lunch at 1.30. Oh, so, uh, you mean we don't get to eat until after we play? <laughs> <laughs> play your supper. Oh, all right. All right. <laughs> so that's the way it goes. <laughs> I thought that it, that, that, that it was, you know, okay. I mean, we could... Uh, no, I think that's probably preferable. It's just that I, I didn't realize the, the order of things. Okay. Okay. So if, uh, if we could start, I mean, um, any, uh, we can go around the, the circle or we could just have people speak up. Which, uh, what would you like? Anybody ready to say who they are and what they do? Oh, so all right, great. Here we go. <laughs> I would think a circle would be easy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, why don't we start with, or, with I, you? Shall I just start? Start with you, and okay. then we can go either way. Yeah, we go uh, <laughs> clockwise then. Yeah, okay. Whatever. Good. Any, uh, like software or uh, drawings also with graphic designers and things and things. Um, installations. Uh, but we also work together. 2007. Oh. In Second Life, we did some. Oh yes. Yeah. With uh, Josephine. Oh. Ryan. So you're Edo. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's so nice to meet so, you. Yeah. See you. Nice. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. So it was only in virtual. So you yeah. We had no. Yeah. Some parts are still there. Yeah. yeah. Is the is the installation still there? In yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I want to take. Wind mills, yeah. I'd like to take people to visit that. Oh, yeah. nice. All right. Yeah. That's wonderful. Okay. Well, pleased to have you here. Thank you. Uh, could you speak up a little bit because because I'm I'm going to be 80, right? <laughs> right. And I have I, I've lost a little bit of of the uh, consonants, and so if you don't speak up, I sort of wonder what it, what it was. What? <laughs> okay. <laughs> So my name is Kili. Okay. I'm from Cyprus, and I'm a student here at the, at the KMT in Brussels. I'm doing uh, music design. Mm. Um, I'm a pianist and also a composer. And I've worked with dancers a lot. And uh, yeah, now I'm looking into more like um, soundscapes, ambient music. Mm -hmm. and A lot. I'm a video artist, uh, or whatever you call it, a visual artist working with video installations, audio and video, and uh, sculptures for the public domain. I worked with um, Elsa Stansfield for over 30 years with the, under the name Stansfield Hoikas, but unfortunately she died in 2004, so I'm now working uh, slowly on my own. I'm, um, I like this, the sound uh, compositions I make are mainly uh, sounds out of nature. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm Mike Kramer. Uh, I work as a sound artist as well, um, creating uh, visual pieces with audible works in it. On one side and on the other side, I produce uh, albums with field recordings and soundscapes. Yeah. And besides that, I'm an artistic director of a small foundation, which is based in the south of the Netherlands. And we, uh, we are there to stimulate sound out and experimental music, try to lift it up a bit higher than it is at the moment. Mm. So the reason why I'm here is uh, trying to gain some more consciousness about the Greek destiny and try to pass that on to 
people who will visit our activities in the future. Uh, my name is Barry Cohen. I'm from Belfast. I am interested in noise and I'm on holiday. <laughs> <laughs> noise and I'm on holiday. I'm on student. Oh, you're on holiday. <laughs> Great place. My name is Angela de Leijer. I've recently graduated as an artist and as a teacher. I'm a project assistant at a small art and technology platform in Eindhoven. And uh, the rest of my time I work as a sound artist and I'm looking for it. I'm I come from Belgium. I work mostly as a Foley artist and I make a lot of sounds for film. And besides that, I also do, I also give a lot of workshops, mainly to children. Um, about sound awareness, and I do this mostly um, in schools in Brussels. And I make radio with the children, but I create a kind of radio program where um, it's also about listening and about creating sound. And mm -hmm. I also teach um, in film school about Ferguson. Okay, all right, thank you. I'm Yolanda, I'm from Spain. And I have a background in classical music. Then it moved to improvisation and experimental music. And lately I'm more like uh, exploring the sound, like its phenomena, and uh, like making installation how you can see it and how, the, how you can perceive it, like from the vision or from the tactile, like with tactile sound and things like this. So, um, I'm interested in how things. <laughs> I'm Lucas. I'm the director of Sonic Act. Um, we invited uh, Pauline, uh, and I'm extremely happy uh, we can have you do the master class and the concert tomorrow. So, uh, um, Pauline will also be part of the conference tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, but what? But what do you? Um, what do you otherwise do? I make uh, with some other people uh, computer art, mm -hmm. um, and we make generative systems for audiovisual compositions, okay. which are um, partly. Uh, so I think what we mostly work on is the algorithms for getting meaningful compositions out of machines. So they partly do things themselves, and partly we decide what makes sense, mm -hmm. so human-machine interaction. Okay. So I'm Pauline, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when, I, when I did my uh, article called Software for People, uh, I was making meaningful, or I was making algorithms to get meaningful music out of people. <laughs> That's why I call it software for people. <laughs> That's in 1978, um, uh, being able to speak about generative systems was not really happening. It was just at the beginning. Yep. Uh, and the, the first uh, computer music was happening at Stanford in, in uh, California. Um, and and uh, I, I remember that Johannes Goebel, who came came from Germany to, to study there at, at, uh, at Karma, and the, they had just gotten a, what was <coughs> called the Samson box. The Samson box was, was kind of the, really the first um, uh, system that could be programmed, and so that was really the beginning of what, what you're now doing. Yeah, tonight, George Dyson will talk about the we'll first. talk about that, yeah. Uh, designs of uh, computers yes. in the right. late mm -hmm. 40s, so... Yes, this, this <coughs> too. But it took, a, it took a long time to get to the point, you know, yep. where it was possible to actually program yep. and, uh, in, a, in a way that didn't take forever. You know. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Hello, I'm Stanley, and 
the sounds of the cello. Mm -hmm. um, I am about to finish my master in the sonology department. Um, and I have been for a long time very interested in deep listening. Mm. Um, and yeah, I think it's a very uh, important concept in, in my work. In, and in what I do, it has inspired me a lot for a long time. So mm. I'm very happy to be mm. here. Very happy to have you. I'm Alison. Um, originally from New Zealand, uh, I've lived in Holland now more than half my life, um, and I guess I would call myself a composing performer or a performing composer, um, although I don't play much anymore, but have <coughs> been between those two worlds um, all my life, and um, between in punk bands, uh, orchestras, symphony orchestras, uh, improvised, live electronics. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very exciting to be here and, and, uh, and to be part of, part of today. Yeah. I'm looking forward. Thank you. That school in Arnhem yeah. uh, was, had been the theatre school for dance here yes. in Amsterdam. Yes. And then they moved to, at, at that school for three weeks. I think it was. Yeah. And then and made uh, work with the dancers. Mm. It was quite a time. Yeah. Michael Norville, and uh, I've been involved with composing and improvising for 20 years. Sort of hybrid art group style, um, using natural phenomena and improvising with the natural phenomena. So uh, working with dance companies and film and things like this. Mainly, my interest has always been about uh, how sound can provoke altered states of consciousness and how I'm more interested in the experiential aspect as opposed to the experimental aspect of music. And uh, lately I've been working on long durational pieces and installations and I'm here at Sonic Axe as an assistant to Catherine Christopher Hennings and I do the sound design and help her get the right sound going. So, And I've known Pauline since I think it was for a long time. I helped her and Ellen Pullman in 1993 in Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm. Do recordings and uh, it's the first time. Um, studying about uh, computer music and sound installation, um, I often use the sound of my bloodstream as a material. Mm -hmm. here because my uh, uh, listening habits are awful <laughs> 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 and I, want, uh, I decided to change it <laughs> and this is the first step. <laughs> okay. Well thanks everybody, you know, you've got, <laughs> got quite a group here. <laughs> Sounds like, we, I mean it's, it, it's very uh, amazing in, in this time, you know, to hear so many people say I'm a sound artist, you know, and uh, work with sound, work with sound, but um, that, that term didn't exist, you know, before, yeah. but now it's, it's, a, it's very handy, but in a way we don't know exactly what it means. <laughs> because it mean, can mean so many different things, but at least it's a place uh, for people where, where they're not uh, necessarily involved in the, in the Western canon of classical music training, you know, um, and that uh, you, can work with, you can work with sound, uh, and sound is understood to be uh, of importance uh, even if you don't know how to read music. <laughs> and uh, I have had uh, a lot of students 
in the in these years where that make incredible pieces, make incredible music, and have never read music at all. Uh, and I, of course, most music of the world is not written anyway, so. so. It's really not a problem, <laughs> but it, the problem, what the problem is, is that uh, conservatories and, and uh, music schools are invested in in, uh, in written music, so that you know it it, it makes it difficult for uh, a lot of people. And for as far as I'm concerned, everyone could be involved in making music, and it, it would be a great thing if if that were happening because music is a very uh, essential uh, uh, realm, or it's an essential part of being a human being to be able to participate in uh, in making music, making sounds, uh, and <clears throat> finding uh, connection with the with place and with world, with uh, others uh, to do that. So. Um, Back in 1970, when I uh, was teaching at the University of California in San Diego, um, we, I was a charter member, a founding member of that music department. And the idea that it, it was, how it was formed, uh, was formed by two composers, Wilbur Ogden and Robert Erickson. Robert Erickson had been my teacher. Um, and the idea was to make a music department where composers could be comfortable, and that it would that the that the uh, <coughs> courses that were taught would be coming out of composition and improvisation, out of creative uh, uh, core, um, and so the most of the uh, faculty that were hired at that time were composers. One, there were a couple of performers and there was one theorist and the, the one theorist was supposed to take care of uh, of that <laughs> uh, theory so to speak uh, but every, everyone else would be involved in, in uh, composing and uh, creating and, uh, and learning uh, what, what needed to be learned but <clears throat> we had a, a very large course for the general student, these are students that were not necessarily musicians at all, had no, no training, and the course was called The Nature of Music. And uh, the way it was taught is that, um, uh, was to involve the students in making music and creating music. And uh, one uh, part of the course was devoted to, uh, every, every student got a, got a, a reel of tape because this was in, in a time when you used tape, not tape music, right? And the tape had a lot of samples on it, of sounds. And they, they had the tape and they had a splicing block and a razor blade. And the idea was for them to cut the tape up and put it back together and make a piece. <laughs> so they would do that. And the, another exercise was uh, uh, to to learn to improvise with with found instruments, uh, to and then to make scores by drawing picture and tell, drawing graphic scores and and explaining what what it meant, and then have the uh, a group of the students to perform the, that graphic score. Uh, so those were some of the things that were done. Uh, uh, plus, they learned a lot about contemporary music and. Uh, what was going on in the field, uh, but it was mostly a participatory kind of course, and there were a number of, of teaching assistants that would work with uh, groups, smaller groups of students out of that 150 to accomplish those kinds of participatory uh, actions. Uh, and so it was, I guess, around 1970 or so when I started to create. The, my work, which was called Sonic Meditations. Um, and these Sonic Meditations, uh, these students could do. And I could, I could uh, 
<clears throat> have 150 students participate in a, a sonic meditation. Uh, and so then in that sense they would get uh, acquainted with uh, a large kind of stochastic process where uh, uh, they would they would be be a participant in a, in a big uh, sound piece, and uh, this was this was very exciting at the time. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, gradually through the through the years, I uh, uh, created a lot of these pieces, and I thought of them as uh, as I said before, software for people, and I also thought of them as recipes. Uh, these were recipes for making music. Which is how I think of algorithms. This algorithm is a recipe for making, getting a machine to do something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyways, so um, um, in 1973, I guess it was, I went on tour in the, in the United States and um, to a few places around the country. And I had nothing with me, no instrument, and I would sit on the stage and invite the audience to do these sonic meditations, <laughs> which was very radical at the time. It was a very radical time. Um, so, uh, going on, just to, to give you a little more history of this <clears throat> practice, First, let me say this, that the reason that, or some of the reason that I wanted to create these kinds of pieces was that I noticed that, that uh, musicians would become very focused on their instrument uh, and on their technique, but that they were not listening globally to everything that was around them. And so I, I got very interested in the fact that, uh, for example, a string quartet came on stage to play, and they sat down, and there was a huge 60-cycle hum going. And uh, they, they started their piece without, there was, there, was, there was a complete disconnect between the sound and the environment and, and the music that they were making. And so it, it then seemed, seemed as if it were a um, conflict. But if there's a difference. If you're actually listening to everything that's going on, then everything becomes a part, a connect, becomes connected to what's going on. And so then, the, then it's, it's not a conflict <laughs> anymore. So I'll tell you a couple of stories about my own performances. Uh, I uh, I was playing in Vancouver uh, in Canada in a in a very nice wooden building. It was it had been a church and and it was made of beautiful wood and it was very resonant. It had a wonderful uh, feeling. So you could play and and get very nice uh, reflections back. And so <clears throat> I was doing a solo and I'm playing along. And about 45 minutes into my my solo, uh, fire engines went went by outside. The sirens were resonating through the building, and uh, and I'm playing with that because I was including the sirens and, and listening to them, and um, I wasn't disturbed or conflicted about it. <clears throat> and after the when I finished, there were people came to talked to me, and uh, there were not one, but three different people separately saying to me, how did you get the fire engines to go and buy on time? <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> and then there was another uh, instance at, uh, when I was playing in Canada again. This was in uh, Guelph, at the Guelph Jazz Festival. And I was playing in a really big uh, square Anglican church had beautiful stained glass windows and a uh, very special uh, place to play in. Um, and I was sp speaking to the audience beforehand because all that day 
I had been watching on television the um, uh, funeral procession of Princess Diana, and uh, a few weeks before Mother Teresa had had passed away. So I am talking to the audience and I'm inviting them to explore with me that I would try to explore the spirits of these two women in in my uh, performance. To these, uh, that they were so such so powerful in their uh, impact on the world and effect. And then I was talking about deep listening and, and uh, explaining the, my practice. And, that, and when I said I have to listen to everything all the time, the, and then the first roll of thunder came. You know, and, the, and the audience went, oh. <laughs> as here as the thunderstorm started. So I started playing. And uh, the storm began to... Uh, increase in its intensity um, and pretty soon I'm playing with these thunder rolls and uh, I'm feeling like I'm playing with the God's percussion mm -hmm. right? it's a really incredible and very intense um, and <clears throat> uh, somewhere in, in the middle of this uh, uh, performance there were two Thunderclaps uh, occurred right up above the church, and they were the loudest thunderclaps I think I had ever heard in my life. They were incredible. So <laughs> I had to hang on there, and then and then the rain came, and the, the rain was simply uh, uh, you know pounding on the roof of the of the church. It was amazing, um, and then. And continued on, and finally, uh, I, my piece was ending, and I ended the piece, and the thunderstorm ended at the same time. Okay, uh, so that's how that went. Then uh, the next day, uh, somebody brought me a little clipping from the newspaper, and it said that not one but two tornadoes had gone through. <laughs> During that performance, <laughs> you know, right, and gone, uh, it, it had knocked the steeple down of, on the church just a block or so away. So um, uh, the review, there, there was a review of the concert also, which reviewed the, the thunderstorm as well. <laughs> so, so um, uh, I guess, needless to say, I mean, I. I listen, this, this is the kind of listening I'm talking about is inclusive, it's inclusive listening, um, or global listening. So we, there, there are two forms. Uh, <coughs> exclusive listening is the kind of listening that I noticed musicians most often were doing, which was uh, paying exclusive attention to what they're playing and what their technique was. but Shutting down is almost like having blinders uh, on your ears, you know, so that you're you're just focused right there. And so I started um, doing these sonic meditations with with uh, students of mine there and uh, in the music department. And then what I noticed was that when they played in an ensemble, uh, that the space would open up. And uh, you could feel the interaction uh, the, uh, of their their listening to one another, but also to listening out into the world as well. And then it became very uh, uh, very exciting in, in terms of their ensemble play. So this gave me the uh, kind of cue to keep on going, keep doing doing the work that I was doing. And uh, uh, in 1988, um, I, w I went with uh, Stuart Dempster, who is a lifelong kind of friend of mine, musical friend, plays trombone and didgeridoo. And we went uh, into uh, to a, uh, a cistern in Washington State 
And this cistern is, is uh, it used to hold water, water supply for the army. It was mm, 50, about 60 feet in diameter, about 14 feet down underground. Uh, it was made of reinforced concrete. Uh, the only entrance, entrance was a manhole cover, and you'd go down, you'd go down a ladder, 14 feet, into the cistern. And <clears throat> the attraction uh, to going into this space was that the reverberation time in that cistern was 45 seconds. Okay, so you play a, a sound, and uh, you get a, you get the reflection back, and the there was hardly a way to tell the difference between the sound you played and the reflected sound. And uh, hmm? it's not good for drummers. Yes, <laughs> it was amazing um, to play in that environment. But it also uh, meant that <coughs> that the listening uh, became very crucial. How to how to how to encompass all of the all of those reflections because the sound would reflect back and it would also travel around the cistern. Um, and although there is a recording which was released in 1989, it's called Deep Listening. So Deep Listening just was born in that cistern <laughs> in 1988. Um, and in, in the liner notes of that uh, CD, I, I wrote about Deep Listening and uh, partly it was a pun because we were underground. That was deep, <laughs> but but it also was because uh, uh, of the way that we had to listen to one another to and listen to our own sound and also to listen to the all of that uh, reflected material. Um, so it expanded uh, the consciousness of, of listening, and uh, so from from that point on. We, we often <coughs> wished that we could simulate that reverberation, could simulate the cistern. And uh, you know, we did different attempts at that, but it was not possible um, with the technology that was available at that time. And uh, it, it didn't get any closer uh, until finally uh, now, at my uh, birthday concert in, in uh, at Rensselaer Polytechnic, where I teach, we have a really amazing uh, performance space. It's called the uh, Experimental Media and Performing Arts Center, and and uh, Johannes Goebel, who used to be at uh, ZKM, is now the director there, and <clears throat> he uh, made the made this place possible, I mean, by becoming the director of it and, and directing the construction of the building, uh, which has four four venues in it, a uh, concert hall of 1,200 seats and a theater with 500 seats and two black box theaters can be configured any way, any way you wish, which is really quite special. And... Uh, uh, he, he, he made this building with such care that even that each uh, space in the building is architecturally isolated from any other, so there's no transmission of sound between any of these spaces. So if you're in one space uh, working in there, you don't hear any other sound from the building, and you hear no ventilation noise. Uh, you, uh, there's no light leakage. So he says that um, uh, silence means no sound <laughs> mm. and darkness means no light. So the, the, it's, it's, a, it's an incredible space to work in. But in any case, what has happened is a colleague of mine from the architecture department has succeeded in sim making a simulation of the cistern. And so we're going to play... This is my birthday present. <laughs> We're going to play in the simulated cistern at uh, the uh, impact uh, in in May. Uh, for the, so that's the first time since that 1988 thing. So this is kind of a benchmark moment of uh, having 
the technology to do to do that. Because the delay is possible. Um, no, it's, because it's, of the space has this whole physical yes, modeling space, system. Yes, that's huh? right. It does, and so it's that. But it's also that the the, uh, the software has been created to to uh, uh, actually simulate exactly the the curves, the, all of the vibrational characteristics, acoustics of that uh, of that system. But I read it's a. 512 speaker system in mm -hmm. the yes, concert that's right. hall that's right. and also with mm -hmm. microphones yeah. detecting mm -hmm. how the it. sound behaves. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So uh, when the audience comes in uh, to the concert hall in, the, uh, in this concert, they're going to come walk into the cistern. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be quite an experience. So. So that that just gives you kind of rounds off the kind of a, a, a long history of, of uh, how I've come to where I am now uh, in terms of, of listening and of doing different kinds of uh, uh, exercises to try to um, uh, open these different portals. Um, all these different experiences that I've had have been very uh, impactful and powerful on me, you know, and have uh, and so the the I guess the um, important thing to me about being a musician and creating new work or creating as I perform is to expand my own consciousness. That's what the purpose of, of making and playing music is for me, is, is to do that uh, as best I can. And uh, so I feel that is a, a lifelong quest. And so I'll probably be, be listening to my own death. <laughs> Well, I wonder what that's going to sound like. <laughs> 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 the Thunderstone. Hmm? Thunderstone. <laughs> <laughs> it's the last uh, sense we lose, isn't it? Listening is not hearing. Hearing is not listening. They're, they're two different functions. Hearing uh, happens because we have the, the mechanism or the, uh, of the ears and the skin to take in vibrations, uh, but that's not listening, it's hearing. <laughs> and listening it happens uh, voluntarily in the brain. Uh, after the sound waves are converted and transmitted to the brain by the mechanism of the ear. So when we talk about a person having a good ear, um, we're not really talking about how they listen, but uh, how well their ear functions. <laughs> talking about politicians. <laughs> They're not listening very well. <laughs> uh, anyway, we have to make a lot more noise. I guess that's why everybody is getting so noisy. Uh, in any case, uh, so listening to me is really something that is rather mysterious. We don't. We can't measure it. Uh, not the way you can measure the function of the ear, the frequency response or amplitude uh, response, and so on. So once you have heard the, the vibrations and they've gone to the brain, then what happens? That's that's the question. So the question is, are you listening? If you are listening, what are you listening to? What have you chosen? What have you selected? Uh, how are you interpreting it? What is your experience of listening? What does it mean for you? How do you act on what on your listening? You know. So these are all questions that are explored and or can be explored if you want to. So, um, some of the uh, 
exercises we do will be designed to uh, to try those things out. So, um, energy in the body, and so uh, if you would like, we can start to do that. And so that means we. <laughs> so um, the first thing I think is is do a little stretching any way you want. Just uh, stretch everything. <laughs> So um, let's uh, let's start by just checking a little. <laughs> this um, checking exercise um, came from one of my teachers, uh, Taoist teacher, Chinese. And um, he would have us stand in a circle and shake, shake for a long time. <laughs> shake more than you think you ought to shake. <laughs> uh, and just, you know, begin to uh, get a sense of it. Uh, like, Shake the use. Yeah. Shake all the dogs. <laughs> Shake everything. And we used to play uh, some very funny music <laughs> as we shook. Shook everything. So everything is loosened up. Okay. All right. So now, this is the body for where the energy moves, how it moves in the body. So now, there are, um, there are three different energies that we want to track uh, as we do these different exercises. So, uh, first of all, uh, try to get a nice natural stance, um, it's called, where the outside edges of your feet are um, parallel. Your knees are sort of soft, as if you were going to sit down. Just very soft, not locked. So, so that um, the weight of your body is distributed evenly. Okay. Um, okay. Your chin may be tucked in a little bit at the top of the head, right over the shoulders and uh, elbows are nice and loose and the palms of the hands are then open and free. Okay, now um, let's do uh, three really good deep breaths. Uh, so we inhale uh, through the nose and then we're going to hold it a little and then exhale through the uh, narrow uh, opening in the lips and let the air sound as you exhale. So here we go. Uh, inhale. And exhale. Good. And then inhale. And exhale. So um, let's just start um, with arm swinging. So try to uh, get a little reaction into this too. And as we get some 
momentum. I'm going to turn palms up, palms up in front, and palms up in back, scooping up the air. And <clears throat> notice that uh, underneath the arms, the armpits, this is good for the armpits, and this is the pits. <laughs> the pits are where we hold a lot of tension. Uh, we hold a lot of tension under the arms because nobody can see it. So this way you can begin to loosen up and release any, uh, any kind of tension that you might have been secretly holding. <laughs> and then nobody will know that either. <laughs> okay. Under the arms, around to the secret place. But also, under the arms, or the armpits, there are lymph nodes and blood uh, arteries, so that <clears throat> when you do this, you promote circulation in the body, circulation of the limbs, and circulation of blood. So that can't be bad. And this is really good for people who sit at a computer a lot. <laughs> so <laughs> you can uh, take a break if you can resist the attraction of sitting at a computer and do this. Okay. Looks like brain to a computer. <laughs> 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 With your back to the computer. <laughs> so then, let's uh, let this start to come to rest. Hmm. All right. So now, uh, just take a moment and uh, let yourself listen to the sensations that you may have, whatever sensations, circulation, deeper breath, more loosening, feel a sense of maybe warmth under the arms. And, you know. Okay. Now I started to say um, that we're going to be tracking three different energies. Um, so there are um, the if you notice in the palms of your hand if there are any kinds of uh, tingling or little pinpoints of sensation that <clears throat> that's probably electricity or the electrical the nerve endings uh, uh, so electricity in the in the body is certainly something that we we track. Okay. So, if you can keep your uh, when you when you finish an exercise that we do, try to try to, to check out the palms of your hands for for that kind of sensation. And it, <clears throat> you might try this, just uh, seeing if you what you feel if you bring make this kind of connection between the palms without touching. And uh, there is a, an attraction, uh, which is the electromagnetic field. So it's another energy of the body. It's a magnetism, gravity. Okay. All right. Mm, feel like that. So heat, electricity, and magnetism or gravity are the three energies that we will keep tracking uh, as we work on, the, on these things. Okay, so check out a stay loose. The uh, main thing is, is, is to keep the body fluid and uh, able to move in any direction at any time. Um, that's a really good principle for playing an instrument. Or making
making sound. But you can make any sound at any time. Okay. And it might come from any any of these energies that we are in, kind of working with. All right. Um, so now, we're going to get this uh, natural stance again. Okay. And we're going to do a little stretch. Uh, so you're clasping your hands. Uh, and turning the palms up right over your head. And we're going to do this stretch very slowly uh, so that you are tracking every uh, increment of the movement. So we're going to move stretching upward first, very nice and slow. And breathing and stretching until you can feel the stretch all the way down to the soles of your feet without overworking it. And then slowly coming back down to the top of the head. And then up again. Each time a little different. Okay. <clears throat> and then now we're going to to move down uh, and stretch the spine and only going as far as is comfortable for you. Just allowing the spine to open and stretch. And then slowly back up. Keep your hands clasped. Good to heart. Okay. Hands clasped. Okay. And then back down again. slow pumping action that's happening. Is there any change in the heat or the electricity? Okay, now we're going to come all the way back up again to the top of the head. And stretching up. And go over to the right. Stretch the left ribs. And over to the left. Mm. Nice and slow. Then straight back. And again. And again. And now we're going to gently release so that the palms are going to float down. Yeah. Breathe. Let your arms 
just float down just as if they were like feathers. Okay. And then we're going to scoop, slowly scoop up and go back up again. Notice any sensations in the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. Make this motion. One more time. Crank it up there, and then let go. Good. That's going to bring it up again. Crank it all the way up. And... Now... Yeah.